power. You know, Mr. Peter will be in his stomp around the country, speaks very often about how other countries dealt with the power challenge. Very often he refers to Vietnam. Uh, I'm pleased that I myself uh, had the privilege of traveling around Vietnam and looking at how that happened for them, a uh, country that was carpet bombed during the war. and was able to ratchet up power production such that the famous Enron badges that caused scandal in Lagos actually came here from Vietnam after they provided temporary power uh, to Vietnam. And we know what is happening. We talk about going from consumption to production. And we know how we have been outpaced significantly by Vietnam in production. A fundamental reason is power. Uh, he also talks about Egypt and what happened in Egypt. Glad I was there in Egypt with him when he went to visit uh, the uh, uh, power uh, program development initiatives of Egypt. I had gone for the Africa Exim Bank annual general meeting about that same time, and we met in Cairo. Um, one man who clearly, clearly has been on top of these general developments around power is a power entrepreneur himself, is Jerome Okolo. And so Jerome will lead off, and Sam will join us uh, from Abuja, Sam Amadi, who for many years was the if you will, regulator uh, from the neck end. And Jerome here, who is the entrepreneur. Jerome, let's begin with how we managed to fall so far behind. And I, and I put this in context. I used to have a power conference annually at the Lagos Business School some 20 years or so ago. And I invited the two main people in power at the time to come and speak at this power conference. Uh, it was Lily Moke who, before he became governor, was a power advisor, as it were. And um, the now late Joe Makoju, uh, uh, who ran NEPA for a bit. And, and I recall their statement that if Nigeria were to get per capita South Africa level, Nigeria would need 88,000 megawatts. I still remember, this was nearly 20 years ago. And we stand here, still talking about 5,000 megawatts, maybe a little more, maybe distribution, maybe that. South Africa itself, as Peter Rubi often says, is declared a state of emergency in power. Put a number of things out to help. And, and we are still so far behind and we have not even thought of it as an emergency. And he's talking about the state of war. How did we get where we are with power? And what are the things that are in the manifesto that can move us uh, forward on this challenge of power? Thank you very much, Prof. Um, I completely agree with um, your analysis that this is fundamental to um, Nigeria's economic prospects. I think um, as a country, we should be outraged about where we are with power. To put it in context, the average Nigerian has less than 250 kilowatts of power per day. That's the equivalent of lighting one and a half bulbs. You can't run a country like this. You cannot produce the wealth that will lift our people from the poverty that we're suffering from. Um, but for us to put in context where we are and where we've come from, let me take you back to around when I was a young man. Um, I grew up in Enugu. Um, my grandfather was one of the founders of the um, uh, Nigerian um, uh, the, uh, um, Council of um, uh, uh, Coal Miners. Um, he used to be um, a worker at the coal mines. The coal mines in Enugu produced coal 24-7. That coal was transported by cable car mm -hmm. to Oji River Power Station, 36 miles away. Oji River Power Station was commissioned um, by the late Queen of England, um, you know, I think in the late 50s. 56. Yes, in 1956. Mm -hmm. And it worked 24-7. Mm -hmm. 
That power was also used for the Nigerian Railways. The Nigerian Railways transported coal mm -hmm. to Kafanchan, mm -hmm. to Kano, to Lagos via the railways, and Nigerian Coal Corporation exported coal to Ghana. In 1974, the second open heart operation in the world happened in Enugu, and the hospital did not have any generators. If power had gone off during that operation, the patient would have died. But they had no need for a generator because in those days, power did not blink. When we say we have a power problem in Nigeria, there are essentially two aspects to the power problem. One is the people who have no power at all, um, mostly in the rural areas. Um, sometimes they have a wire coming through the village. Oftentimes, especially in the north, there is no wire at all. They, they have never seen or used electricity. Now, in 2023, uh, we should be outraged that there are citizens of this country, one of the richest countries in the world, who have no access to modern life. Uh, essentially, if you have no power, you cannot live like a modern human being. Then the other aspect of the lack of power is the ridiculousness of industries in places like Lagos, in places like Agbara, in places like Kaduna, in places like Kano, in places like Abuja, in Port Harcourt, who are reliant on monstrous, polluting, diesel generators. generators. Mm. We should be outraged that as a country, the presidency has generators. If we're expecting a foreign head of state, we go and turn on the generator. Mm. That should not happen in 2023. To illustrate how bad this is, I'll take you to Ukraine. Ukraine has suffered 160 rocket attacks in the past three days, yet power in war-torn Ukraine is more stable than in Nigeria. It shows you that the management of the power sector in Nigeria is worse than ourselves declaring war. Man-made disaster. Man-made disaster. It's like the people who have run this country have so disorganized the country that it is worse than a country that's being bombed on a daily basis. Um, if you remember, um, uh, after the 2014 crisis in Ukraine, um, Ukrainian patriots cut off the power supply to Crimea. Uh, Crimea had about 3,000 megawatts of power. That's roughly what Nigeria generates in a day. And Mr. Putin asked his people to put po uh, power back into Crimea. It took them 10 days to restore 800 megawatts of power into Crimea, 10 days. And within about two months, they had full power in Crimea. Um, I'm not supporting uh, the annexation of Crimea. I'm just using that as an illustration that a place like Lagos should not tolerate uh, power inadequacy for more than two months. And we've tolerated it now for close to 40 Decades. years. Mm -hmm. And so um, what does the manifesto say that I find attractive? And by the way, the power situation is beyond politics. Mm -hmm. It's above politics. As a citizen, all of us, uh, as citizens, all of us should be interested in why things are the way they are. The idea that power comes on and goes off and comes back on with no warning is something that any citizen of Nigeria should be absolutely outraged about. And what I like about the manifesto is that the manifesto, first of all, breaks down the problem. The problem is that we do not have enough power, so there's power inadequacy. The problem is that we do not have reliable power, so it's um, uh, epileptic power supplies that go off and on that's not um, reliable. And then the, the, the other one is that we have a, a sector that is um, impossible to invest in. And so if you don't get investment into the sector, you will carry on with what we have. Let, let me, let me uh, obviously we'll come back in this conversation. But Sam, uh, the environment for investing in power, uh, Sam, you uh, managed the regulator NERC, NEC, uh, for several years. And I, I recall that at some point during your time there, I... <clears throat> was working with a, a certain um, group of consultants, uh, a firm started by two Harvard professors, uh, uh, and we tried to engage you uh, on how you could create a seamless environment that would therefore make it attractive for investors to want to come in. Uh, from your perspective, what has held investors back from this sector that obviously has plenty to offer anybody who would like to make 
an investment and get a decent return on his or her investment. Okay, uh, thank you, Prof. I, I think usually, it depends on who you ask, if you ask the operators, they would likely say tariff, tariff, tariff. And the truth is that uh, in by 2010, the tariffs were very, very good. But by today, they are significantly better, comparable to some of our West African countries. Or in fact, in the top, in the West African, but I moved from the top to middle and now to one of the top in terms of talent. So it's it, not just about the talent, which is important. But I think the most important thing is the risks in the system. The risks, for example, by the time we privatize, we don't even have, we didn't have a good customer base for the discos. Um, it was rushed for just reason, and then the level were obstruction, obstructionist. So um, they don't have a good data in terms of customers. Again, risk with collection. If you look at, at the, the re revenue, if you look at the revenue we have, uh, um, you see that the risks, if you look at revenue, you see that the risks uh, are high in terms of revenue. So revenue losses, uh, collection rate is almost, in many cases, 20%, 30%, 40%. So that shows that the, the losses at the level of collection is very high, which results from uh, not paying bills. Uh, at the time, the federal parasite were owing so much, and we will have to force Jonathan to issue a directive that uh, they should take their budget rate and pay. So if you have a system where you sell power, and test of recovering the money is very low, arising from inefficiency in the network, arising from deliberate failure to pay by security and parasita, then it tells you a story of even though you know potentially the demand supply gap means there's a market. But in reality, the, the, the inefficiencies mean that the many things have to align before you can cash out on that profitability. Now, look at issue around network constraints. Today, we have an average of 2,000 megawatts that probably we can't set to the grid because of transmission failures or gas supply. Now, what's the problem with gas supply? When we started, we, we had to um, pay off two, 213 billion of legacy debts we have paid off as a way of stimulating gas supply because gas suppliers were moving towards more of uh, the industries not power because power had first a bad gas price and gas transport. Secondly, very low credit worthiness. The the, the jenkos were not paying because the discos were not paying them, and that continued. We had to improve the gas price to a more, much more competitive level, improve gas transport costs. But today, the, that debt continues to mount. So gas suppliers don't want to send gas to generators because they're not paying them because they're not receiving, the receivables are low from the discos from customer end. So, so you, you hear about, oh, we don't have full capacity in generation because we don't have gas to fire the power plants. So in Russia, the system needed consistent leadership to keep on removing those risks improving the environment of doing business, Sam, ensuring policy continuity to a large extent, yes, the policy of This government has not cut let, let me take advantage uh, so of that problem. point. Sam, to, to ask mm -hmm. a question, and, and you are in a position to offer some counsel given the role you played. You know, oftentimes, uh, uh, I push the point that one of the biggest risks of doing business in Nigeria is not market risk, it's regulatory risk. Exactly. It's how regulators be behave. And I take this gas example so that you can give counsel on how we could perhaps manage things differently. Nearly 30 years ago, Nura Imam, a friend of mine who was an Air Force general, was minister responsible for um, mines, I guess, power that included the, the Nepal was reporting to and all of that. Shell had a proposal that went through the Federal Executive Council in which private capital would pipe gas into our major industrial centers in Kano, Abuja, Lagos, all, all, all of this. All private sector, gas 
and how it's collected. Everything was worked into this market. Uh, a friend of mine, um, Charles Osezua, was actually advising on this project from the, the government end at the time. And Federal Executive Council passed it. Two or three meetings later, Nurem Mam comes back to council and says, the people in Nepal are not happy with this thing. Boom! Nigeria has lost billions since then because of this one error of judgment of the Federal Executive Council. How are we going to prevent things like this from happening going forward? Very good uh, point, Prof. Okay, now look, look at two things. First is misalignment. In the UK, you have the object, which is Office of Gas Market. So the regulator of the state regulates gas, which means the gas pipeline, which, is, which makes sense because most of the uh, gas relates to energy. In the US, the same thing, FEC, regulates gas transmission as well as electricity transmission. So there is a handshake. They, they, they make the gas regulation in line with market condition in electricity. In Nigeria, because of the obvious role of NMPC as our cash cow, NMPC manages the gas. These are two institutions that are misaligned. Under that night, there was effort to align them through regular meetings. So what we see is the incentive for gas people does not align with the city for power people. So we try to close that by first liberalizing the gas uh, pricing. So whatever they give us, we, we become takers. Whatever the gas people give us as price, as cost, we factor it so that it passes through costs. So electricity, they don't have complete overpricing. But what has happened is if you don't have a market oriented process where generators and gas people, Free taker, free, free, uh, willing buyer, willing seller. And that price goes down to the value chain, which means at every time the gas supplier doesn't care about power you're selling, then he cares that you pay, take or pay, you pay him, and you have a long term agreement, and he sends gas, and there's no constraint. But if you ask him, please don't send me today, or please, because there's potential failure, don't send gas, he, he feels more comfortable sending to the, those who do plastics fertilizer plants that are giving him very reliable long-term contracts and with regular payments. So I agree with, with you about regulatory risk. But in this case, maybe even no regulation, because effective regulation would mean that the power regulator ensures that money flows back to the uh, power generator and straight to the gas supplier. So misalignment is one aspect of it. The second aspect is that, look, the reason why we have problems with electricity is that unlike telecom, which is plug and play, electricity has so many values, value chains, and each of these value chains must operate at a certain level of efficiency. So if, for example, the discos we have to today are very difficult to implement change management and therefore maybe meet their customers, recover all the revenue, you're going to see a shortfall of that money flow back to the, the operator and back to the uh, gas supply. So if the operator uh, cannot pay and now says, instead of uh, 300 uh, uh, MBTU, give me 200, then it signals to the gas operator that this is not a reliable market for me to sell my product and the shift. So I, I think that the regulatory risk here is a failure of the regulator himself to create certainty, which is what the domestic supply obligation try to do to assure gas producers that this is the price, regular price improvement, so that they too will commit to regular supply increase at the point where we now have willing buyer, willing seller, and uh, adequate supply, adequate uh, uh, pricing for everybody. Secondly, it's supposed to show regulatory certainty in ensure that payments flow back. I think the real crisis with the gas sector is that the electricity sector is not strongly being regulated to ensure that everybody meets a minimum repayment. When we're there, we had a certain minimum repayment. All discos must meet up that uh, uh, minimum repayment. And then we have uh, marked for the gas supplier, prioritize the gas supplier. So if there's a shortfall of revenue because of losses, then the gas sector receives full payment because it's a sector that is not part of the power sector and therefore has less incentive to 
you know, get a haircut. They just want that payment. So I agree that we need to look at the regulatory process. But at the same time, we need to make the electricity market real solvent. If there's no cash flow, if there are no good payments for the supply because of weak distribution collection, or if uh, money is not well used and you don't prioritize payment to gas suppliers and other service providers, then you are going to have less incentive for both investment in expanding supply, the molecules, the transport facility, and also selling to power when they can sell to overseas market or even sell to uh, competitive uh, non-power industries like uh, fertilizer plants, aluminium, the dangotes, and other other uh, big commercial consumers who need a regular supply of gas. So that's really the problem. Regulatory certainty, good commerciality, and strong leadership in ensuring that all the value chains align and operate at a high level of efficiency. Thank you. Uh, uh, Jeremy. Yes, uh, thank you very much, um, uh, Dr. Amadi. I think um, you will be very happy to hear that um, from my reading of the manifesto, the uh, Obidati manifesto actually exactly um, answers your prayers. So on the two points, um, the proposal from the manifesto is to consolidate um, the regulation of joules of the unit of energy within uh, NERC. So NERC will also manage the gas code. That's what the manifesto clearly says. And therefore, the disjoint between the, the production and sale of gas and then the production and sale of electricity will disappear because the regulator will, as you rightly said, in the UK, where you have um, Ofgen, which manages both the gas contracts and the electricity contracts under the same table and is able to um, uh, make sure that there are no uh, obvious um, disconnect bef between the, the um, two um, uh, sources of generation of, of power will be resolved. And that is one of those um, uh, kind of innovative ideas that I see in the manifesto. And then the second part, which is actually a masterstroke, is um, the, the key point why there's no investment, the return flow of cash through the system. So ele electricity flows in one direction to the customer, and the cash doesn't flow back upstream to all the people who participated in creating the electricity. And again, the manifesto is um, offering to redesign Embed to be the efficient ele electricity market that takes charge of all the funds coming in. And then, therefore, the, the distribution of money within the Nigeria electricity system will then be on a non recourse basis. It will not be dependent on the uh, discos sending money upstream uh, to other participants, but the money will come into a pool and based on the contracts that have already been agreed by, um, by NERC, the money will go to the discos for their work, the transmission company for sending the electricity around the country, and then to the generators, and then to the suppliers of feedstock like gas. And then it also will, will be able to cope with the new generation coming in from uh, the renewables, the solar power, the wind power, the wave power. Um, when you have a system that ensures that once you put power into the system, you will get money back without having to go to anybody's office, without having to beg anybody, and without having to go to meetings. That is one of the fundamentals in, uh, with regards to uh, making sure that investment comes into the system. Investors are very, 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 very simple people. They ask very simple questions. They ask you, who owns this project? Who has developed this project? Who is providing equity? Equity, is, equity means who is providing the first money that goes in and the first money that will be lost if this is a crazy idea. And so investors never give money to governments because in governments, nobody owns the project. And um, the idea with the other manifestos, when you see the idea, you know, they will say, OK, we'll add some more billions of Naira to the budget. Those things will keep us exactly where we've been. We will not make that leap forward into the new economy that uh, we all hope. things to you, Gerald, uh, in, in this regard. One, the uh, idea that I talked about earlier when I was you know, asking Sam's question, an idiom that I was collaborating with back those years, had tried to put together a seamless way of interfacing all the players in the system. And then part of the reason was to protect the, the loans that Central Bank was giving to the system so that they are not lost. Central Bank loved the idea, uh, but somehow, one of those things, we never got that uh, uh, in place. How, besides these suggestions being made, can we 
ensure that all the actors can interface in a way that sees themselves as cooperating, even if in cases they may be competing, and therefore do not work at cross purposes. Because what happens currently is that there's a lot of working at cross purposes that's preventing the system from being able to deliver power cheaply to the people and profitably to the investors. So if you deal with that on the one hand, the, the, the second question is just do a comparative analysis of Nigeria, Egypt engaging Siemens and why the outcomes seem so different. Okay, thank you very much, Prof. The um, answer to the first question, in answer to the first question, I would describe what we have, which is not working, and what we should have, which is what will work. Um, uh, if you remember the book, um, Anna Karenina, um, uh, the, the first sentence says that all happy families are alike, they look alike, mm -hmm. and all unhappy families are different in their own unhappiness. Nigeria, we always get in trouble when we want to create something you know, super specific, something that allows for people to play the system and has all the loopholes that allows people to essentially steal money. Um, if we do what other countries do, then you make money by creating something and by working hard. Um, and if you, if you have no place on the, around the table, you will not be called around the table. The problem we have in Nigeria is that people who have absolutely no business in power are called to sit around the table to talk about power. So let me explain um, you know, the actors that we have in the room. Today we have uh, TCN. TCN, for all intents and purposes, is NEPA. TCN is unreformed. It's not changed. It sits in the same building with the Ministry of Power. Um, the same people who were there before were there during NEPA, and they are still there today. They wait for the budget, and their job is to essentially spend the money in the budget until the next budget. Um, they have no consequences if the grid works well, and they have no penalties if the grid doesn't work well. So that clearly is a zombie institution. That institution needs to be helped. The peop there are some smart engineers there. They need to be, um, they need to, uh, somebody needs to come there and create a condition where the smart guys work, and people who have no use um, in, the, in the institution can ship out. Then the other part of this whole system are, are the Jenkos. The Jenkos are a very interesting lot. We go from a company like Azura, which is a world-class engineering result. You know, it's a Siemens factory that works like clockwork. It generates power reliably. It can give you uninterrupted power if you want to take it. Um, then you have some companies like part of the Niger Delta Power Holding Company, 11 generating companies. Some of them have no gas supplies. Some of them have no power evacuation. Some of them have their turbines already condemned. And that's, again, another zombie sector that needs to be cleaned up. Then you have um, the uh, distribution companies. Dis distribution companies come in different shapes and sizes. But ultimately, they do not have today an incentive to give you uninterrupted power. So they give you power some of the time. They send you bills that sometimes have no connection to whether or not you've received power. Um, they know they will always get money. They get some money from you as a consumer, and then they go to Abuja and get even more money. So that is what we have today. It's a whole network of people with different interests, different objectives that are not aligned to supplying power reliably, cheaply, um, and accessibly to the Nigerian populace. What we should have is we should have a system where if you want to play in this market as a power generator, um, like in the UK, um, you sign a contract. You have to deliver power at a certain time of a certain quality of a certain quantity. If you do, you get paid. If you don't, you pay fines, big fines. So you set up a bank guarantee to the system that I will deliver 100 megawatts of power 24-7 every day of 2023. And any day you don't deliver power, you get fined. And any day um, that you deliver power, you are 100% sure you'll be paid. Then on the other side, we need a transmission system where the operators of this system are incentivized to continue to improve on it. If you look at pictures of China, how they, and America, and UK, and Germany, all the developed countries, you see men hanging off high tension, thousands of volt wires, working on live wires to make sure that that system works all the time. Uh, you go to places like Russia, where you go from minus 50 to plus 50, they still make sure that the system works. 
You go to Canada, they have some uh, weird uh, um, uh, weather events, and they still make sure that that system continues to work. So you need an operator of the transmission system who is paid to make sure that this system is up and running nearly 100% of the time, so 99.999% of the time. That is their only function, to make sure that the electrons can flow through the system in a way that they do not make the news. So no news, you get paid. If there's news, you lose a lot of money. So you need somebody who can give, again, another financial guarantee to the system and say, I will make sure the power flows through the system. And then you get paid for that. And so that is the kind of um, uh, new economy which some people are not interested in. And I hear people say that P2B is too transparent for Nigeria. But unfortunately, being transparent is what delivers this type of lifestyle. You know, on the first telethon, we had uh, an American, uh, an investor in the public sector, speak to this um, manifesto and what they find attractive uh, about it. And clearly, one of the most important things in getting things done is sunlight, Absolutely. transparency. Absolutely. Um, we have an elite that has lived off rent in a year. Many policies fail in Nigeria because powerful Nigerians don't want Nigeria to work. Because their so-called money is from Nigeria not working. Um, but interested parties all over the world do things that eventually lead to boundaries that prevent these kinds of things from happening. That's what institution building is about. What is it that has... And, and Sam, I'd probably like for you to start out on this. What is it about the Nigerian experience that has been very disruptive of institution building, where we can have boundaries to conduct that ultimately we can say that there are certain settled habits of a community, which is that this is reward for your work and this is behavior that you get heavily sanctioned for and, and, and so on and so forth, weak institutions. You have been in that power sector. What makes for these weak institutional arrangements in the power sector? Okay, a very, very important question you asked. Uh, lately, I've been reading up on the failure of the Nigerian project. In fact, the last is uh, like a diamond uh, book on uh, class, ethnicity, and so on and so forth. Now, the private sector um, advocates forget that market is embedded. You know, we, we used to have a theory in political economy, you know very well, called embedded markets. So markets are embedded in social relations and social conventions of a people. The power sector, when I came in, I observed that the power sector was on balance in the power sector plan. Um, so much was focused on um, privatizing without thinking about reforming. So in a little piece I wrote, I said privatizing without reforming. You talk about, uh, uh, um, uh, sorry, uh, Jerome talked about TCN, for example. Now if you look at the power uh, roadmap and look at the EPSR out and look at the NEP, there are stages. First, on bundle, which we did. Second, you corporatize, which means all these entities, TCN, Abuja, uh, Abuja uh, Disco, or Enugu Disco, uh, Protocol Disco, they will all have their own separate corporate management, board uh, and management teams set up differently. Then they were operate by corporate rules, code of conduct, run like companies. Then the next stage, you commercialize. That means they're going to run as basically enterprises that be profitable, least cost, quality of service. But until we sold those assets, there was no effort to fully corporatize them. TCM didn't have a board up to today. The discos, even though they've been corporatized, Lagos, uh, company, Eco, 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 and so on, they were still being run as if they were part of the parastat of Minister of Power. I recall I had several issues I quarreled with, with uh, the minister and up to the up to the president, where I said, look, this is a regulated entity. The essence of regulation is that every cost 
must pass through regulatory oversight for prudence and for relevance. I remember one instance where the minister says, let's put, we need to put five billion on AFAM. I said, Mr. President, there is no uh, uh, report, there is no um, uh, 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 cost benefit analysis, there is no cost, not to audit, telling us what this five billion is going to do and what value, because all costs in the power sector has to be recovered to the consumer. So you must show it's relevant, you must show it is prudently acquired. I had issue with NNPC, a most of uh, petroleum there. So what am I getting to, sir? Is that even though we say we are privatizing, even though we say we are going to do private sector electricity market, we are still running the underlying norms and values of those operations and not the market values of market transparency, of clarity, of regulation, which means you pass all the costs to the regulator he does put those check, confirms that those are relevant, and then approves the reverse. So these are some of the challenges we have. Uh, okay, I was going to say something. Yes, uh, yes. Uh, I, I want to sorry, I, I'm back. Let me conclude. Okay. 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 Should I? Should I buy, sir? To conclude. Okay. So the final point I want to make is that. You are right, sir. The, the values, the norms, and the regulatory framework we, we, we run, and also the policy, the, the notion that this is a market, you are going to hands off, you are going to run by rules. I recall, for example, when you are supposed to have independent uh, directors in each of those entities, and then they have not, you appoint persons who are part of the consortium as independent uh, auditor, uh, directors. You compromise on that oversight. The final example, we were supposed to hand over to, to this, uh, this, these entities to, to the owners. I was with the vice president. I said, sir, they have not met up the requirement of the rules for handing over the certificate. But the vice president says, look, sir, they want, let's give them, they'll come back to you. So I think the lesson is, you need a government a leader like Peter B, somebody who will first have lack of commit, who is not peculiarly connected to transactions. If you are in government, and you are part of those who are buying assets, then you already compromise the level of policy neutrality, the regulatory objectivity and strength you need to drive the sector is compromised. Again, we, we claim to run market-based operations, but essentially, we are basically running state capitalism, which is the fact that the government is a true proxies, get involved in these operations, and therefore compromise their capacity for fair, objective, and market-enhancing regulation. So I, I think really that there is a cultural and value problem that is also making our transition to markets not efficient, and even sometimes worse than efficient public ownership. The effect it can have of state capture. I mean, you can see it play through in the power sector. The whole privatization process was perceived as an opportunity for friends to get something that will make them easy money. They saw how people who went into telecoms made so much money. So they took the same mindset. Oh, well, our friends can make so much money in the power sector. Forgetting that competence and capacity to actually build that sector were critical factors. And everybody's stuck in the mud. The country is suffering more. But... Uh, okay, consumes plenty of power. Exactly. You know, I don't know I, how much yes, it is. I, I want to come in as, uh, as the common man because <laughs> I've been listening attentively and I put myself in the mode of the, the average power consumer who does not understand all this grammar. Mm -hmm. uh, like Peter B said in one of the sound bites, mm -hmm. that is only in Nigeria that people are forced to know Jenko, Disco, Jenko. and all manner of jargons that they are not supposed to know. Yeah. What you want is turn on the switch and you see power. All right? Jigen. All these jargons that we are saddled with as yeah. consumers, we don't want to know all this. Yeah. We want a society where things are functioning. But having listened to all this, what I take away from it is that the reason nothing is working, the, the way I break it down in my head, one is um, regulatory inefficiency, inconsistency of policies, overbearing effect of elite rent seekers who just, or what we call cabal, mm -hmm. who just want to make sure that nothing works. Mm -hmm. Now, in all this power play of the high and mighty, 
Is there anything in the whole power policy or power equation that empowers the people? Because we always say power belongs to the people. Yeah, power absolutely. belongs to the people. All right? Is there anything that the consumers can do on their own part mm. to hold people accountable, yeah, to make sure that if I have this meter and these people are going to be collecting bill, there's mm. also something that I can do if I don't get the services that I'm paying yeah, for. Yeah, you is know, there... In a, in a place like uh, uh, New York, till today, Coned has to run public rates hearings where uh, interested members of the public will come and Coned will present its uh, issues and propose rates. And people will say, no, we should not be able to interrogate and challenge those. People actually then hold because in many ways power is a monopoly of sorts. You you know the, the competitiveness that you have in selling homo is not there with power. It's got to be some kind of you know oligopoly of sorts that plays in that sector. Because of it, there is a necessary reason for the people to listen to you and question your rates. Uh, 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 this, Prof, uh, uh, yeah. I just to just, <coughs> excuse me, just to join um, to answer the question about um, what the people um, uh, have to, um, uh, what the people can do, and how they get power into their hands in order to change things for the better. Um, I think it's important to um, actually point out that the powers that be, the cabal, as OK put it the people who own the country, as some other people put it, mm -hmm. they are being a little short-sighted. And so I have good news for them. Mm. The ideas contained in the Obidati uh, Manifesto are actually ideas that will create bigger opportunities for people who already have the means. Yeah, but they money. have to do the right thing. Yes. So um, I'll give you an example, for example. Um, the, uh, if you look at Brazil, for example, Brazil Electric has a market cap of $87 billion dollars. Now, there is none of these companies in Nigeria that has a market cap of anything that's significant. They are all you know, in the tens of millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. Nothing significant because of the system we've built. I even have bad news for the owners of Nigeria. The bad news is the way you have built Nigeria and the way you have made money, you're going to fail in the one fundamental thing which anybody who is successful wants to do. You cannot pass this money to your children. Next generation. Because the money is not standing on solid foundation. Mm -hmm. The money has not been made in a way that you can transfer it to the next generation. Mm -hmm. and, and therefore, the vision that the Obidati um, Manifesto presents is a way where we start to do things in a normal way. Mm -hmm. And we start to build things in ways that can be transferred. And we start to build things that are bigger and that make sense for everybody. Mm -hmm. And finally, with regards to the common man, uh, the common man has an advantage. Um, I'll just say something, which is solar power has fallen in price by 90% in 10 years. Mm. In another five years, nobody in northern Nigeria will be forced to buy power, power from somebody yes. who is not supplying power on a reliable basis. Mm. And therefore, this is a time for us to build a system that can continue to add good services to those common people to make them to want to sign on to power mm -hmm. from big companies. No, they just put one thing on their roof. Otherwise, they will generate they themselves. they need you. Yeah, yeah but the, uh, to return to a question that I, I raised, just to get Nigerians to understand how differently our leaders think from leaders of other countries and why we are behind and why the Ubidati approach is different. Let's compare Nigeria and Egypt and their agreement with one company called Siemens. Okay, thank you very much, Prof. So the um, agreement with Siemens, uh, the way the Egyptians went about it and the way the Nigerian government went about it shows us um, you know, two different ways of doing things. In Egypt, the government knew that the government um, is not a power company. They can't design, manage, and run things like this. So they invited companies in Egypt and said to them, we want to strengthen the transmission system, we want to build new generation, and when all these are working together, we want to build a high-speed electrified railway system to connect all the Egyptian cities. Three things they wanted to do. They had clear objectives. 
and they made sure that the country understood these objectives. They were not going to change. And so uh, two companies stepped forward, Ellsworthy Electric and Orascom. And those com companies provided the initial equity, I think about $400 million. And then the Egyptian government then worked with Siemens to raise all the debt, about $8 billion, from about 30 banks to finance uh, the project. So you had an owner who understood electricity, who had tens of thousands of workers, who had know-how, who had engineers, who knew what they were doing, who had project management staff, and they were not going to change. They were not here today, gone tomorrow, people. And therefore, um, they were able to, in 27 months, build brand new capacity of 12 gigawatts of electricity. And now they finished the, um, they finished the generation um, set, um, stage of the project. They, they've done the strengthening of the, of the transmission. And right now, they're building the high-speed electricity network. Come to Nigeria. We did it in our own way. So we set up a government commission. And then you know, the chief of staff to the president traveled um, and signed some contracts. And then they, we set up a government uh, company. Um, and then we signed a contract with Siemens. And then the Siemens project in Nigeria is being paid from the budget. So the Federal Executive Council will meet in uh, January, and decide to issue money to Siemens. The Ministry of Finance will go looking for the money. The money may or may not turn up after three or four months. And when the money turns up, Siemens starts working. When the money runs out, they stop working. And so um, a case of two countries in Egypt, done and dusted in Nigeria, we're still waiting for the next Federal Executive Council meeting. Wow. I mean, it is so painful. I mean, for me, I've been traveling to Egypt since 1986, fairly frequently. And, um, and just seeing what has happened in a short period under LCC and what we are doing says what the meaning of absence of leadership is. Yeah. Um, when we were talking about this power thing in Egypt, a group of us just standing outside um, during the last Afro-Exim Bank annual general meeting. There was a president of the um, uh, AFC from Nigeria here who was in our group and, we're, and then he said, look, just give you an example of what we're talking about. And they co-financed the project. Uh, because time matters. You see, the Egypt one is all dusted 20, how many months? 27 months. Our own, we've not even... When I made a statement on this matter some months ago, federal government had to quickly begin to say, no, the transmission, you're going to start shipping from Italy. Because at that time, I knew, or I heard, that Siemens may be going to a kind of force majeure because some of the equipment for Nigeria, which came from our budget, was being manufactured in Ukraine, which was now being, Whoa. yes, war, you know, and all of that. But Egypt's own, 20-something months, the power was in place, it was running. Our own, we, first of all, we took several months to walk it through our executive council. The Minister of Finance had to be gathering the money. Then we paid. Then they started building it in Ukraine and somewhere. When I talked about this on TV, they said, ah, no, no, the one from Italy will be shipped soon. I've not seen them yet. I don't know, unless, uh, unless you've seen the equipment uh, right yet. <laughs> but, but they're still... We've not seen anything. Besides the fact that we lose so much time in all this pussyfooting, finagling that we're doing, and that is cost. Time is money. We're losing that advantage. There is the fact that by the time we get this in place, windows of opportunity will have gone past us. And many times we don't get... As I gave the example of Nura Imam 30 years ago. We, if we're going to catch up with that error, take us under 20-something years, maybe. And somehow the Nigerian people need to understand these things. Because our people are not educated on policy and don't pay attention, governments are killing the Nigerian people every day with wrong choices. And this is what this program is about. It's what the elections process is about. It's what political parties are supposed to be about. To articulate these things, look, in South Africa, ANC policy issues are discussed at world level, all the way back up and affect government policy. In, we only discuss words when elections are coming. We want to give people money to get. We need to reinvent Nigeria. Because if we're not going to do that, we're going to be fluffing and fluffing in the bush for a very long time. I, I, I think that, you know, power 
is of such fundamental importance. If we say going from consumption to production, how can we produce when there is no power? The average vulcanizer has to find a better pass my neighbor to do. Do you know that once power is just generally available, this economy, the GDP ramp up from no, and you don't do anything else, just that you have power available, will be in multipliers. And here we are talking about things that small countries have solved. And I, I finish this with a, a, it's not a joke, but it's, it sounds like a joke. A friend of mine who was a minister uh, in Nigeria in finance was on a flight. While he was a minister, common minister, from somewhere in West Africa into Lagos. So, and the person said uh, uh, to the minister, not knowing he was a minister, said, you Nigerians, this problem with power, this problem with power, is it that you people don't know where they sell these generators? If you don't, I can introduce you to them because this thing is a very simple matter. Light problem was solved a hundred years ago. When the minister landed, he thought the only thing that made sense was for him to call me because he said, Patrick Tommy would like to hear me. Okay, we gotta go. Uh, we'll return to Adiboyi. Uh, Who knows? First of all, let oh, us oh. say thank you very much. Ah. To you. Thank you very much to Mr. Jerome and uh, Sam Amadi and um, uh, Professor Pat. Thank you very much. Um, well, what, I, what I, my takeaway from all this is uh, as complicated as this whole thing for you, the lay person who's listening, because we know that there are lots of young people who are tuned in who want to understand because this power thing affects them the most. For all of you, you have seen all the big players in the power equation, all the big, big grammar and all the big policies, and which was why I asked that question, where does the poor masses come into the equation? And my takeaway is that it's your, it's your PVC last, last, mm. because it's for you to elect people who have clear-cut policy on how they are going to transform this whole thing. And once you miss it at that point, whatever you get, you take it like that.